Good evening. I'm Dr. Britt Nicholson, a Senior Vice President for Development at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I do hope that you and uh, your extended family are all healthy. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, you don't need a microphone or video capabilities to participate in this webinar. And at any point during uh, the webinar, you are able to ask questions through the uh, Q&A feature, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and a shareable link will be provided after the event. So let me start out by thanking you for joining this, e this evening and for your continued support of the MGH Fund as members of the 1811 Society. Uh, unrestricted dollars provided by donors like you to help us drive key efforts in all aspects of the hospital's mission, including patient care, research, uh, education, and the communities that we serve. The flexibility of the MGH Fund helps us respond quickly when faced with either unexpected challenges and opportunities they seed innovative programs and invest in talented clinicians and scientists. Now, in addition to your support of the MGH Fund, many of you also contributed to our efforts to fight COVID-19. And on behalf of all of our patients and staff, uh, let me thank you. Tonight, you will also have an opportunity to hear firsthand how Mass General clinicians and scientists responded to COVID-19 with fascinating presentations from Drs. Chloe Villani and Michael Philbin. You'll also have a special opportunity to hear from Rick Frisbee. Rick is a member of the MGH Fund Leadership Council, and he will share his own story about why his family made it a priority to support science early on in the pandemic and why they continue to champion the MGH Fund. For the question and answer portion of tonight's event, we're very fortunate to be joined by physician in chief and chair of the Department of Medicine, Dr. Katrina Armstrong, and chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine, Dr. David Brown, as well as Dr. Harry Orff, Senior Vice President for Research, and Dr. Susan Slogenhoff, Scientific Director for the Mass General Research Institute. But first, I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Peter Slavin, Mass General's president, whose superb leadership was vital to helping us and everyone else tackle the crisis. I'd like to make note that this will be Peter's last 1811 Society lecture since he's announced that he will be stepping down as president of the hospital. On a personal note, Peter and I have been colleagues for 35 years and I've had the extraordinary good fortune of serving under his leadership as president for the last 18 years, seeing an uncaring, unerring ability to always do the right thing. And um, Peter, uh, you're just a marvelous human being. So now, Dr. Peter Slavin. Brett, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. The feeling is, uh, is mutual. Uh, and I want to thank uh, all of you for uh, joining us uh, this evening and uh, and hope you are well uh, and that you and your family members have uh, had an opportunity to get uh, vaccinated. <clears throat> this has obviously been an extraordinary year for the hospital and the 27,000 men and women who make up our hospital community. They have really uh, done yeoman's work this year, responding to the needs of our patients, uh, ser serving our community. And, uh, and as you'll hear this evening, advancing our research uh, all during the, this COVID pandemic. But I also want to thank you as members of the 1811 Society for partnering with those 27,000 people, because without your support, many of the things that we were able to get done this year simply couldn't have happened. Uh, we use some of the funds from, from the MGH Fund to uh, help support our clinical efforts related to COVID. We use some to advance our community uh, support for some of the underserved communities that we partner with. Um, we also used it, as you'll hear, to, uh, to support our research effort related to COVID. And we also used it to support our staff. Uh, we put in place a program for staff that was facing financial hardship. Thousands of our staff members applied and we were able to offer them all uh, $1,000 uh, grants to help them get through this pandemic, thanks to your uh, generosity. Um, 
MTH is, is a place where four things happen simultaneously, clinical care, education, community health, and, and research. And tonight's program really focuses on the intersection between our research effort and our clinical uh, mission as well. Uh, during COVID, uh, our teams of investigators and clinicians across the institution really worked in hand in glove with one another to put in place uh, clinical trials, do uh, basic research on um, antibodies, uh, vaccines. It really was a breathtaking effort to see all this work going on, particularly during uh, this pandemic. There were more than 1,000 peer review articles that were published by our investigators during this time related to COVID. And our research program has never been busier as measured by our grants, the, uh, the amount of research spending uh, all during a pandemic. I wanna give a particular shout out to uh, Harry Orff and the hundreds of people across this organization that worked so hard to make our research laboratories very safe. We had virtually no transmission of COVID within our research uh, uh, laboratories. And that uh, took an enormous amount of effort to, uh, to make sure that our research labs were a safe place to, uh, to work. So during tonight's presentation, you're gonna be hearing from two clinician scientists uh, who's, uh, who collaborated during this pandemic and saw that uh, blood samples were able to be analyzed from hundreds of COVID-19 patients as they came through the emergency department, enabling our clinicians to determine with a degree of uh, certainty, the level of severity of newly diagnosed uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, first individual you're going to hear from is Dr. Uh, Michael Philbin, who's an emergency physician and director of clinical research within the MGH's emergency department. He is an associate member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, and his research uh, typically involves the uh, early detection and management of septic shock, but he, like a number of other of our investigators, pivoted toward uh, COVID during this uh, unprecedented time. Uh, he co-chairs the uh, sepsis early detection think tank with the mission of joining translational researchers and clinical investigators within the Harvard community. The uh, other uh, physician scientists that we're uh, fortunate to have with us today is Dr. Chloe Villani, who holds the uh, position of principal investigator at the Mass General Center for Cancer Research and the Sem Center for Immunology and Inflammatory Diseases, where she is the director of the Single Cell Genomics Research Program. She's an assistant professor of medicine and also an associate member of the Broad Institute, and she has received numerous honors, including the MGH Transformative Scholar in Medicine Award, the Damon Runyon Ratcliffe in Innovation Award, and the NIH Director's New Innovator Award. As Britt mentioned, we have an all-star panel of, uh, uh, of panelists who will be joining uh, these two uh, uh, clinician scientists, uh, and, and Britt already mentioned who they are, and I just want to express my gratitude for the, to them for being here with us uh, this evening. So I'd, I'd now like to uh, welcome and turn this uh, Zoom meeting over to uh, Rick Frisbee. Had the uh, pleasure during my tenure in this uh, position to get to know Rick and his family well. They have been incredible uh, supporters and uh, ambassadors uh, for the MGH over the year. And, uh, and Rick and his family decided during this uh, pandemic crisis to step forward in a really significant way to help make sure that the needed clinical research related to COVID could uh, happen at Mass General. So Rick, thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking all of you uh, on this call for the great support you've provided to the MGH Fund, and also for joining us this evening for this uh, virtual symposium for the 1811 Society. Like all of you, I've been a strong supporter of the MGH Fund. And I'm also a member of the MGH Leadership Council because of my strong belief in the importance of the unrestricted funding that's provided by the fund. We don't have to look any farther than the COVID-19 crisis to remind us of just how essential this type of support really is. Uh, specifically, gifts to the MGH fund allow Mass General to act quickly and respond to this sort of unexpected event. Under Peter's leadership, it comes as no surprise that Mass General has continued to play a leading role in the global response to this health crisis. In the 20 years or so that I've been associated with Mass General, I've gotten to know Peter very well, and I wanna personally thank him for the great leadership that he's provided. The MGH Fund also provides crucial funding uh, for the groundbreaking research and clinical projects 
uh, that you know take place within MGH. And there are two areas that I've also personally supported. Several years ago, my wife and I provided funding to assist Dr. Chloe Villani in establishing her lab, which is focused on studying the human immune system and its response to disease. Uh, last year, we provided funding for COVID-19 clinical research and trials, which I hope provided some assistance to Dr. Michael Philbin in his role as Director of Clinical Research and Emergency Medicine. And more recently, my wife and I provided funding for the MGH Research Scholars Program. And like the MGH Fund, the key to this program is its flexibility. This kind of unrestricted funding for research is relatively rare, and it's exactly what was needed to respond with speed and agility to a crisis like this one. Tonight's presenters, Drs. Chloe Villani and Michael Philbin, are great examples of the remarkable talent that we find at Mass General. Their talk will focus on the critical collaboration within MGH uh, that began at the onset of this pandemic. Uh, their approach in the battle between human immunity and this lethal virus will once again highlight the importance of leading edge science. It's a place where MGH truly excels. Uh, so with that, I'm now pleased to introduce Drs. Chloe Villani and Michael Philbin to begin tonight's presentation. Thanks very much for listening to me, and thank you all again for your support of the MGH Fund. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take over the presentation at this point and share my screen. And hopefully pull up my slides. There we go. So thank you very much for inviting us to speak here. I'm very honored personally. And, you know, Chloe and I are going to tell, I think, one of the stories of, of, of COVID-19 research at MGH. And it's a story that Chloe and I have been intensely in, involved with since the beginning of the pandemic surge last year. And as stated previously, the theme of this story is the importance of a multidisciplinary uh, approach to accomplishing something relevant in research and bringing together different teams with varying skills to, to do what they do best. So the story really began several years ago when I joined forces with investigators within the Department of Medicine uh, and the Broad Institute to develop a pipeline of investigation to learn more about the human immune response to sepsis and this pipeline began with uh, enrollment of patients in the emergency department. And this is a, co a collaboration that was championed by Maurizio Fava, uh, the director of clinical research at MGH, um, who was really a strong supporter uh, of our collaboration, which leveraged um, the technology of single cell RNA sequencing that uh, Chloe is gonna describe to you shortly. Uh, and our work uncovered a previously undescribed immune transcriptional cell state uh, in sepsis that we think might be an important driver uh, in sepsis pathophysiology. And our work was published last year in January of 2020. And it was really a, a timely segue into what was about to happen um, because at about the same time, there was a cluster of pneumonia cases breaking out in, in China, and it didn't take long for it to, to rip through Europe and start to hit the US. Um, and on February 26th, it was still kind of business as usual, uh, despite the fact that there were, there were cases cropping up in the US, and uh, Biogen decided to, to host an international conference in person in Boston. And, and several days later, we got word that people were starting to get sick. So we repurposed our ambulance bay into a, a makeshift COVID clinic. I remember being called in uh, that weekend for a 12 hour shift uh, to see these patients that were, that were getting sick from the conference. And it was certainly a, a premonition that, <clears throat> that something big was about to happen. And in the next couple of weeks, um, that turned out to be the case. And then particularly at MGH, which was, um, really one of the hardest uh, hit or the hardest hit hospital uh, hospitals in our region, uh, seeing a really high volume of acutely ill COVID patients, uh, given our proximity to some of the, the COVID hot zone communities. 
was a really changed the way that we thought about coming to work um, in the emergency department. And I, I think, you know, the, the assumption by many of us was that that we'd probably get sick at some point and it was just a question, a question of when. So at, at the time, you know, all non-COVID clinical research was halted um, to minimize staff exposure to sick, uh, sick patients. Uh, and with my research team standing idle, we made the case and were quickly approved uh, to scale up our sepsis pipeline and begin enrolling COVID-19 patients uh, in the emergency department. So we enrolled uh, sick patients when they arrived. We drew 10 milliliters of blood from them, uh, which is the equivalent of two teaspoons. Uh, we separated out the cell components of the blood from the plasma, froze it down uh, to be sent out for analysis. Uh, we did the same at days three and seven uh, during the patient's hospitalization uh, to follow the immune trajectory over time. So Olink and Somalogic are two companies um, that run large proteomic platforms and they agreed to run our samples uh, free of cost. Uh, Chloe's lab did all the single cell sequencing and we also sent samples out to um, a number of other Harvard affiliated labs for, for different analyses. So this effort required a large team, um, multidisciplinary, with scientific support from the Broad Institute and others, Drs. Marsha Goldberg and Nir Hakkoen were my sepsis collaborators and they were instrumental in getting this up and running and operational as were Chloe and, and Moshe, part of uh, Nir Hakkoen's uh, lab. And this is a time course of MGH inpatient beds occupied um, with COVID-19 patients. Um, since the beginning of the first surge. And <clears throat> the black line represents uh, the total number of inpatient beds occupied by COVID-19 patients. And this peaked at just under 400 patients during the first surge, broken down by general care beds occupied in red, and then ICU beds occupied in blue. And you can see that the, the I ICU occupancy of the primary surge was just under 200 patients uh, which is really remarkable. And our enrollment period spanned uh, the, this first uh, COVID uh, peak. And you'll notice um, the second surge that we experienced this past winter, beginning in November and kind of peaking in January when vaccines started to become available in Boston. And notable is um, the marked decrease in ICU um, requirement for these patients. So during the six week enrollment period, um, we enrolled 384 patients through the emergency department. 80% of these patients ended up uh, being COVID positive, which is quite remarkable. So 306 patients with COVID. We also looked at the 78 <clears throat> patients that were COVID negative. Of the COVID positive patients, 14% died within 28 days. 22% uh, uh, were intubated, mechanically ventilated, but survived to 28 days. And this is really a remarkable cohort in, in its size and also just the density of, of severe illness that we saw dur uh, during this time. <clears throat> So there's a number of different investigations that have come out of our data. And I'll give you a, a, a few of the highlights. And we recently published our proteomics uh, work that's gotten some media attention, which is, which is gratifying. So the proteomics, which consists of uh, over 6,000 proteins uh, that we measured, essentially gives us a protein fingerprint that reflects the activity of immune cells and molecular pathways in play, not only in, in the COVID patients versus the non-COVID patients, but, but in the severe COVID patients versus the mild COVID patients. And we saw patterns of immune cell activation uh, in tissue injury that was characteristic of severe disease that tended to persist um, and, and increase in fact in, in patients who ended up dying. It was kind of like a, a feedback a loop of inflammation and tissue injury 
that just got worse in some patients. But there were some variations to this fingerprint that tell us that not all the severe patients behaved in the same way. And there appeared to be a subset of sick uh, patients based on their proteomics um, who probably have different disease pathways activated based on their, their protein makeup. And we think that possibly there are subsets of COVID patients that might respond uh, better to certain therapies. And those patients will be defined by their proteomic uh, makeup. So we also saw um, patterns of tissue injury and specifically uh, injury that indicated liver, uh, cardiac injury, a lung injury, and injury to the blood vessel lining. And that's particularly important because that leads to leakage of fluid into tissues such as the lung, which is really characteristic of this disease. And lastly, there was a distinct lack of neutralizing antibody responses uh, in those who died. So this is evidence that an inadequate immune response uh, to, to contain the virus might be a key driver uh, to worsening disease. And inadequate immune responses might be expected in, in older patients and in those with chronic diseases uh, who are in fact at risk for higher death, uh, or at risk for death um, in COVID. So <clears throat> there were a number of accomplished investigators uh, around the Harvard system that have uh, used our samples to kind of flesh out this story. Uh, Stephen Elledge's lab described over 800 uh, surface epitopes or proteins of the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and found a high cross-reactivity between uh, antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 and previous human coronaviruses, which has implications in the importance of prior immunity. So having been exposed to these viruses and they published this work in Science last summer uh, Galit Alter's lab uh, took a deeper look at the natural antibody uh, response to different domains of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein using our samples. And they found that antibody levels to the S2 domain, and that's the domain that's most conserved across the different coronaviruses, uh, that was highly correlated to survival in our patients. Um, and that was not the case for antibodies against other domains of the spike protein. So this is really an argument to design vaccines and monoclonal antibodies that target spike domains that are least susceptible to mutations over time. So the domains that are likely to be preserved in virus variants that are now popping up around the world. So they also found a strong correlation between the common coronavirus uh, immunity and, and survival. So having prior exposure to prior uh, coronaviruses and having an uh, intact immune health uh, leads to rapid expansion of the immune response and helps contain and uh, clear the virus out of the system. So the last little piece of the story that I'll <clears throat> add is Jonathan Lee's lab. They did viral, uh, viral load analysis showing that illness severity is directly correlated with level, uh, levels of viremia, uh, which essentially is the amount of you know, a virus uh, in the bloodstream. And in particular, uh, this was the viremia was pronounced uh, and, and high in patients uh, who ended up dying. And this is a really important link to the, to the whole story. And what our data is telling us is that a uh, compromised antibody response leads to unchecked viral spread in the bloodstream that in turn results in inflammation and tissue injury that we see in the protein signatures uh, of severe illness. So that the last part of the story is the single cell transcriptomics. And that's Chloe's part of the story and she'll guide you through that. And as of note, this is by far the most complex uh, aspect of the story and probably the most difficult to, to flesh out. So I'll, I'll leave that to, to Chloe.
I will not make it sound too complicated, hopefully. Uh, so it is a pleasure and honor to speak to you all today. Um, I am one of these hybrid scientists. I'm both an immunologist and a genomicist. And before joining uh, the wonderful MGH community in 2017, for 20 years, I worked in a genomics, different genomics institute. The previous one was the Broad Institute. And what I really wanted to do is bring my know-how and these cutting edge technologies that I specialize in to big, translational problem in the clinic, I wanted to ground uh, the research questions to what frontline workers like Dr. Philbin faces. And this pandemic presented a truly unique opportunity to, to leverage these technologies. And so I'm going to first introduce to you some of the questions we were tackling. And thanks to the generous support of Mr. Frisbee, um, I'm going to introduce you to some of the technologies we were uh, able to bring to MGH. And so I will share my screen. Um, and so Dr. Feldman introduced the, the, the questions very well. And so using our cutting edge technologies, we wanted to tackle three big questions and admittedly we're still tackling them. You know, when the patients present in the clinic and the emergency department, initially they may all look very similar, right? They have acute respiratory distress syndrome. They have a high hard time breathing. Yet some patients may rapidly get discharged and some others will develop this hyperinflammatory syndrome that is out of control. It, this all look the same at the beginning. Is there any way we can define why people have such a spectrum of symptoms? Why do people do well and some others don't? Um, you know, why is it that some patients only get lung involvement and some get multiple organ involvement? Could we predict outcome earlier? This could really help with clinical decision making. And with the type of data that I will be presenting, one of our slightly longer term goal is to help guide clinical trial design and identify new tuber targets. Because in reality, um, this virus is, is here to stay to some extent. So how do we start tackling these questions? Well, I'm a, you're gonna hear me say I'm a big data person. So what does it mean? So we first collected large cohort of um, patients. So Dr. Phil Bin mentioned this very large cohort that includes, I shouldn't say 800 patients, but 800 blood samples from 306 COVID positive patients. We've also uh, teamed up with different clinicians at, at MGH to perform autopsies from patients that unfortunately passed away and collected over 400 different tissues. And we covered a range of severity from the patient that got discharged to those that got hospitalized and intubated, and unfortunately some passed away. We then measure billions of of measurements, both in the cells and in the liquid part of your blood, which is called plasma, that um, Dr. Philbin introduced to you. And we analyze over hundreds of tissue from these 17 patients that passed away. So when I say big data, I mean over 2.6 million cells. Every cell has about 20,000 genes times 6,000 proteins. That's what I mean by when I say big data. I'm gonna tell you how we uh, generated these data in a, in a, on the next slide. And then I should say, I'm also a hybrid scientist. I lead a group that is both experimentalist that can generate the data, but we also develop computational tools to uh, analyze this data. And our goal is to identify predictors of outcomes. And so how do you, if you know nothing about the disease, how do you go about figuring out what are the guilty cells or guilty processes that drive the disease? I wanna introduce you to the concept of um, single cell genomics. So traditionally, I like to use this fruit salad analogy. Traditionally, the way we've been analyzing the content of a tissue, a sick tissue, let's say we take a biopsy, is analogous to analyzing the content of this fruit salad. Here, the analogy would be that every piece of fruit is like a cell. Let's say we take a piece of your skin, or in this case, we should talk about lung. And let's say that the four blueberries you see here would be the cells that would be driving the disease or would be infected by, by SARS-CoV-2. The way we've been analyzing the content of this fruit salad is by doing a fruit smoothie. We look at the average of all the fruits in the, or in this case, all the cells together. So now if I ask you, can you taste blueberry? How many blueberries are there? Are there blueberries from the West Coast of the United States or on the East Coast? There would be no way for you to tell me. Now with the, the concept of single cell genomics, we can actually analyze every single piece of fruit in the fruit salad or in this case, every single cell. And uh, not only that, through computational analysis, we can regroup all the, in this, I'm showing fruits, but think of cell here. I can regroup all the cells with similar features the same way I can regroup the pieces of fruit. And I can quantify 
how many I have. And it's, it's like the next generation of microscope. I can do more than that, actually. Beyond telling you I have apples in my fruit salad, um, I can tell you what type of apple. So let's say apple is a specific group of family of cell. As you may know, there's many different types of apples. And different apples have different properties, and they're good for different type of recipes, you know, whether it's cooking or making juice. Well, um, I can tell you exactly what subset of apple, in this case, what group of cell is driving the disease. And I can do more than that. Let's say we focus on the golden delicious. I can tell you if it's a juicy apple or dry and rotten apple. It's the equivalent of saying if I have a good cell that's healthy and functional or if it's completely defective. And all of that I can do through my single cell technology. So how does it work? How do we capture the single cell? I'm gonna show you a video, it's, it's true microfluidics. And it's the same principle of doing a salad dressing at home where you have vinegar and all sitting. And if you shake it, you make an emulsion, you make droplets, you may not see them, but this is what you're doing. So that's how we capture cells from microfluidics. I will see below in the video. What you have here going through this way is actually oil that can parse the, the fluid cause, um, coming through in drops. And then if you pay attention to the very bottom part, you're gonna see something very small right now. It's a cell that goes through and the big dot is actually a gel bead. And so here you have a snapshot of what it looks like. It's a drop in which you have the tiny cell and this gel bead. And the gel bead contains an agent that when I melt the bead, it lies open up the cells and allows me to capture all the genomic material. And that we can do at scale. We can capture thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of cells per experiment. It, the, the rate limiting step is truly cost. So we've used uh, these technologies to um, interrogate two cohorts. Uh, the blood cohort uh, that Dr. Philbin introduced to you, we worked around the clock with Dr. Philbin's team and Dr. Goldburn's and Dr. Icohen's team from March to May, even I roll my sleeves. We covered from um, uh, 7 a.m. for blood processing until 2 a.m. seven days a week from March to May. And uh, this is the team um, for the autopsy work. And you can see we have very different type of protective gears. And so even though we were not frontline workers, we felt like we were contributing to the community. So I quickly show you some highlights of our autopsy work. And then I'll mention how this all links to our blood cohort because in reality, some patients that were in our blood cohort unfortunately passed away. And so I'm sorry this, this is overwhelming, but I will introduce you to this table. Every line is one of the 17 patients that passed away. And when there's a dot, it means we've collected tissue from one of these organs working with our amazing pathologist at MGH. And one thing I wanna point out is um, the disparity of the patient. We had quite a few African-American and Latino and that's perhaps representative of the disparity in the Boston area. Often people tend to think that patients who passed away were older, and I want to point out that some patients were actually younger than me. Uh, they were in their 30s, some were in my age range in their 40s, and that to me was quite shocking. Um, most patients had lung involvement, but some had multiple organ involvement. So we use, so we actually banked over 400 tissue specimens over the course of two months and a half. And we use our technologies to create maps of what was going in the different tissue, including the lung of these patients. So I'll show you a map. This is not meant to be overwhelming. Think of it as a map of the world. I'm gonna show you a map of the organ of the lung. Every dot different, that is a cell. And when we give it a color, it means we give it a unique identity. And so this is a map of 100,000 cells from the lung of 17 patients where we identified 41 different populations. And the major continent means their major family of cells like epithelial cells or immune cells. And so with this map, we started answering different questions. Are all the cells infected in the lung or are there specific cells infected in the lung? The answer is that there are specific cells infected in the lung by SARS-CoV-2. That included specific immune cells, specific epithelial cells and specific endothelial cells that line the inside of your blood vessels. And that could explain some of the cardiovascular complication we see. We ask if we also have data, the same type of map for healthy lung. And so we ask, are there cells in the lung of COVID patients that are either enriched or depleted compared to the lung of nor a normal lung? And the answer is yes. Actually, it was quite shocking to see there was a massive infiltrate of immune cells, which perhaps can explain the collateral damage you see, because when you have uncontrolled inflammation in your lung, it does damage your tissue. 
We also see, saw a lot of uh, increased number of cells of endothelial cells lining your blood vessels. I'm sorry about that. And a lot of fibroblasts. And fibroblasts are these cells that you can see sometimes appear when you have fibrotic lung, a lot of lung injury. And that gets your lung much harder and makes it hard to breathe. Um, and so then we ask, looking at our data, what lung biology is affected that patients are passing away? So I'll tell you a little bit more about this, focusing on these epithelial cells. So quick 101 about lung biology here, looking at this figure. Uh, alveolus are these tiny sac at the end of the tiny branch of your airway, where uh, you have the gas exchange between the lung and the blood, where you exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide. And the key cells in these sac that are doing this are called AT1 cells or epithelial cells. And AT1 cells can die, that's a normal process. And we're lucky we have reservoir of cells that are called AT2 cells. They can self-renew and they can become AT1 cells. During COVID-19, both AT1 cells and AT2 cells, they can infect it and they die. Which means that the AT2 cells that normally can replenish the AT1 cells, which are key for you to breathe, um, doesn't happen, it's completely stopped. We observe in, in some patient, there's actually cells, progenitor cells higher up in your airway that can be recruited in the sac and can become AT1 cells, which is a process that has never been seen in, in human, only in mouse. Another important thing we saw is that, you know, in these alveolus, you have an agent called surfactant. It's this agent that's pretty important because it recreates surface tension between the liquid phase and the gas phase to allow you breathing. This surfactant is actually produced by AT2 cells. Now I told you AT2 cells are dying. And so that's having an impact on the level of surfactant, which makes it even harder for a patient to breathe. And that can explain some of the reason why they're passing away. We also saw that these alveolus, these sacs are covered with a, immune cells that are, that are amplifying the damage. We also created maps for the lung, uh, sorry, for the heart, the kidney and the liver, because this patient had complication in these organs. And interestingly enough, we didn't see any viruses in these organs. It doesn't mean that virus doesn't necessarily go in these organs. It could have been clear by the time we analyzed this tissue, uh, but it could also mean that perhaps they don't get infected and people simply suffer from the damage, uh, collateral damage of the virus. Um, and so uh, Dr. Philbin introduced you to this large blood cohort we did together. And so we did a similar map of the blood. This is ongoing work. So I should say the autopsy work just got published in a journal called Nature a week and a half ago. And, and so the blood is ongoing. So when you take blood and you spin it, you get different parts. You get the liquid part where you can do the protein analysis. You get the immune cells and you get the red blood cells. So we isolated the immune cells and create a map. And now we have a map of 2.5 million cells from all of these samples. And to give you a sense of scale, normally in a normal experiment, we can do 4,000 cells per patient. And the cost for 4,000 cells, the data generation for 4,000 cells is about $3,500, just to give you a sense of scale here. And so we're currently finishing analyzing our big map. This is actually one of the biggest data sets that exists worldwide across all existing disease. And we have already identified specific cell types, including specific groups of myeloid cells in your blood that can predict if you're going to do well or not well. We've also asked the question if there are cells that you find in the blood only in the context of COVID infection. And to answer this question, we've created a different map of 1.2 million cells from healthy individual. And we're comparing our maps. And we've already identified cells that you only find in the blood of COVID patients. Finally, um, we want to understand if just looking at your blood, I can predict what's happening in your lung or in your heart or any other organs, right? The idea of liquid biopsy, because actually doing biopsy really is a risky procedure. And so to do that, we're currently comparing our map of the blood with the map of the lung I, I told you about. And so this is ongoing work. And I'm happy to talk more about this. We have several other efforts using these same technologies in, in patients that are pregnant, uh, as well as in the context of pregnant and got COVID-19, as well as in patients that are in clinical trial. And I think Chloe, we can move to the question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So Chloe, thank you very much. I think we have some questions coming in right now. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, sort of distribute them around. I think, well, the first one's for you. Uh, one of the questions is, why is it that uh, we've uh, made such rapid progress 
in the development of vaccines, yet the progress in the development of therapies seems to have lagged so far behind. I can tackle that question. Um, okay. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the development of vaccines is, is perhaps the most important uh, component um, to, uh, to making our population better and preventing COVID. And that's kind of exactly what we're seeing um, in the proteomics, at least in the, in the story that, that, um, that Galit Alter is, is telling us about the antibody response um, um, and the importance of having uh, prior immune um, exposure to not only you know prior coronaviruses, but um, but you know epitopes of the spike uh, protein of the, the current SARS-CoV-2 virus through the vaccines, and also through uh, as you see in that the time course that I demonstrated of the the first spike versus the second spike, um, albeit that's. Um, not entirely, you know, due to um, the vaccines and, and probably in part due to some of the therapies uh, that went into play between the, the first and the second spike, um, being steroids, being remdesivir, antiviral medication. Um, I think now that the population is vaccinated, any subsequent spikes are going to be much, much smaller. So importance of developing vaccines, number one, I think um, uh, importance of therapeutics, number two, there are still gonna be patients who, uh, who become ill. We are seeing patients uh, who have been vaccinated, uh, who are still getting ill, in particular immunocompromised patients, older patients who probably don't amount, uh, amount uh, adequate immune responses. But like the proteomics, again, are, are telling us that all these patients with severe COVID, they're not all the same type. There's not the, the same disease pathology going on. There's different subtypes of patients that probably respond differently to different therapies. And when we study these patients, we look at the entire population of, of COVID-19 patients coming to the hospital and being treated with these therapies. So it's, it's difficult to, to tease out uh, which patients might respond um, best to certain therapies. So I think developing therapeutics is much more difficult um, than developing vaccines. Okay. Thank you, Michael. So Dr. Villani, were you particularly surprised by any of the findings of this study, specifically in relation to how patients of color were impacted? I think we were surprised by all our findings because we started with very limited knowledge. You know, now, now through the news broadcast, we all know a little bit more about how this is unfolding, but you have to put yourself back in February um, 20, 2020, losing track of time. And so, um, and, and, and so everything was a surprise. Um, we did, um, we have the blood cohort about, and Dr. Fieldman, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think about 40% of the cohort is of Latino descent. Um, and for African-American, about half of our autopsy cohort is, uh, is African-American. I think it's more reflective of the socioeconomic environment where, where we in, and we, you know, the disparity. Um, it's not that it was specific biology, it was just a setting of these patients. And so the biology observed has nothing to do necessarily with, with um, with the ethnicity of these patients, at least not in the context of how we study them. In terms of surprise, um, yeah, I was surprised that some of these cells infected by the virus, I didn't expect these specific cells to be infected. Even in the lung, we didn't expect to see such drastic problem with lung generation. I could go on and on and bore you to death with my scientific technicalities. Um, but you know, we went from knowing nothing to having an initial map that we can work with our colleagues in the clinic to try to think about, can we think of new therapeutic target? And that is a win. If you think we did all of this in a single year, this never happened. It rarely happens. It, I shouldn't say never happens. It, and so this, this has been quite um, an achievement that I'm very proud of. And this would not have been possible without, I, I never worked with Dr. Philp and this brought us all together. And now I do want to continue to work with him because I'll tell you something he's spectacular as a clinician, but also uh, as a person. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Orth, this one's for you. It says, with all the attention on COVID, what happened to the rest of Mass General's research during this period? It's a great question. Um, we were actually very fortunate that uh, the NIH, uh, when COVID hit and laboratories around the country shut down, the NIH announced that um, they would continue to allow researchers who were working on grants, even though they weren't able to pursue their work immediately, they would allow them to continue to be paid. And um, what the hospital did is we shifted into a, a remote work pattern whereby all of the researchers, except those working on COVID and doing essential lab functions, they were sent home, but they were told, let's, let's continue to do our literature research, let's write papers, let's write grants, and for the computational researchers who essentially do dry work, let's shift and continue to work from your home. Um, with respect to getting our people back into the labs as quickly as possible, we work closely with infection control. And as we learned that masks work, that hand hygiene work, as we learned how practices could be done to allow you to work safely in and among others, we instituted those processes and policies throughout the labs. And so we were able to get back to work I think much more quickly than um, some of our colleagues around the city and country. And as a result of that, um, we were able to continue our productivity um, much, uh, frankly, greater than I expected, uh, where we actually matched our, our outcome financially uh, during the COVID year. We matched the outcome from the previous year. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brown, this one's for you. Um, it says, uh, especially at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, it would seem that you'd wake up in the morning and read a story about one medication that was working and then the very next day, it was disproven. So since your, your physicians in the emergency department are at the very front lines, how would you disseminate knowledge uh, on, on that rapid a basis to all your clinicians to making sure they were up to date with the latest findings? That's a great question, Britt. And it wasn't just treatment uh, algorithms that were changing every day. That were, there were also guidelines around how to protect ourselves, which type of mask to wear, who should wear them, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, so that there was uh, re really tremendous coordination across the hospital and across Mass General Brigham, actually, uh, trying to keep the information flowing, uh, trying to keep some of the noise out of the information. And there was a lot of noise, especially from the federal government uh, during the early part of the pandemic that wasn't very helpful. Uh, and then at the local level in the ED, we had a team of clinicians, physicians, nurses, and administrators whose sole job really during, especially during that first surge when, when the time period you're alluding to, whose sole job was to update our guidelines and educate our staff that were actually taking care of patients in the ED. And they rounded through the ED multiple times per day with literally updates that were changing hour by hour around infection control and on treatment. Uh, and we learned a lot from that process. Uh, and some of those things will be quite durable in terms of what we learned. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Armstrong, this one's for you. It says, I've been hearing in the media lately that academic researchers are struggling to maintain momentum in their work and that this will have a lasting effect on their careers, especially young researchers. So first of all, is this true? And if so, how is the hospital addressing the problem? Oh, Britt, what a great and important question. I mean, I guess I was reflecting as I was listening tonight and listening to um, Mr. Frisbee open up that you know, it was really his vision to bring Dr. Villani here that made this all possible some years later, right? So without the investment in the scientific pipeline, in the researchers who are fundamental to this, both at the junior level and at the research scholar level, like Rick talked about, you know, we are in danger of not being able to respond to a health threat like this or a smaller health threat in the future. So nothing could be more important than that investment. Britt, I think what we're seeing is that it is a very fragile and high risk time, particularly for certain groups. 
So of course, there's a group that had a large amount of research going on who pivoted their labs now to go to COVID and need to be able to re-go back to that research to be able to rebuild the experiments that were not able to be done on cancer and diabetes and lung disease. And those take investment. And as Harry said, NIH is trying, but we have been trying to invest to get those experiments back up, to get us back to where we were, because those other diseases matter too. Um, we've got to get that back and going. I think the second issue that I'd bring up though, is that we've had certain groups affected much harder than others. And I know people have seen this across the media. So people with small children at home who did not have childcare, did not have the ability to have their kids in school, you know, for many of them, they are now a year behind where they were. And these are the best and the brightest. So these are folks who have invested decades in their training and to lose them now would be a national tragedy. So I think what we're doing at the hospital level, Britt, is to really make sure that we provide every type of support that we can. But you know, this is a really critical time for us to invest in that pipeline, because if we lose that pipeline now, we'll only really feel it you know, 10 years from now when we're not creating the treatments that have come out over the last decades for all those diseases and are making such a difference for our patients right now. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, the next question comes in from Rick Frisbee. And, uh, and before I read the question, I think each of the panelists uh, uh, will probably have a view on this. And so I'm, so I'm going to ask you to uh, you know, start the answer, but I'd invite everybody else or anybody else who uh, wants to uh, uh, respond to it as well. And Rick says, given what we've learned from COVID-19 research, are we in a better position to address any new viral pandemics we may face? So Sue, do you want to start with that one? Sure. I mean, I would say uh, yes. I think we've learned a considerable amount um, over the last year. I think that our research teams were able to pivot to to study COVID. We have a, you know, a better handle on what what things might look like as we go forward. And I think that you know, just the the ability of um, our scientists to shift what they were doing to study COVID. You heard beautiful examples tonight from the speakers about the way that they, you know, immediately pivoted from what they were doing in their labs and started looking at this. So I think the answer, the short answer, and I'm sure people have a lot of thoughts on this is yes, I think we're much better prepared now. We still have a long way to go. As Dr. Armstrong just said, we still need to continue to support the scientists and especially the young scientists so that in the future, if something like this strikes us again, that we will have a pipeline of people, a, you know, a research workforce that will be able to respond to something like this. And I'll turn it over to anyone else who wants to jump in. Okay. I might jump in and just uh, share my experiences um, with how prepared we were. And this may be coming from, from, from an emergency department perspective, but it was really remarkable um, to see my colleagues and, and leadership, um, like you say, to kind of pivot to COVID, but almost as if we've been preparing for this our whole careers and um, you know, how we um, address the sick patients uh, you know, that, that needed to be intubated, um, you know, the, what we've learned to do from the very beginning, uh, care for critical, critically ill patients, um, we did that. And I was really proud uh, of my, my colleagues. Another observation and and what I presented is that I, we kind of thought we would all get sick and very, very few of us got sick. Uh, very few, it's surprising how, how few of us got sick and the, the PPE worked. Um, and, and I just think that, that uh, it was astounding how prepared we actually were in, in this surprise. I could take a swing at, at it too, Britt, if there's time. Sure. Uh, I, I would say yes, but. Yes, we're better prepared, but. Um, and as Katrina said, we have to continue to invest in our young scientists. As, as somebody asked earlier, why aren't there such, 
so many, why aren't there a lot of good treatments for this disease? And the answer is that it's hard to produce functional antiviral drugs. There aren't a lot of good antiviral drugs for the ver various groups of viruses that cause disease in humans. There are some, but they're not all that effective. And I think that's really the truth about SARS-CoV-2 as well. So we need more research in this area uh, in the development of, of antiviral drugs in general. And, and, and just not to sound too um, pessimistic, but SARS-CoV-2 was very transmissible, but had a relatively low death rate. Some of you remember SARS-CoV-1, which was not very transmissible, fortunately, but had a very high death rate. And so the things that keep me awake at night are how are we going to handle a SARS-CoV-3 if it has the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2 and the, the mortality impact of SARS-CoV-1. For that, we need investment in infrastructure in the hospitals. We need a whole bunch more single rooms, which we hope to have in our new building. We need more negative pressure rooms in the ED and across the hospital. And, and we need, as Katrina said, as Dr. Armstrong said, a, a lot of investment in our young scientists who will develop the vaccines and therapeutics of the future. So I would say that we learned a ton, uh, but we are not prepared for SARS-CoV-3 the way I just described it. Hopefully I will, it won't happen that way, but. Right, if I could just add, you know, I just wanna say like, um, if you look at what you have on the screen, the collaboration between Dr. Villani and Dr. Philbin, like those collaborations are real and they can be kept up and they can do incredible things as we move forward. I totally agree with David that if we've got learned one thing from this, it's that we can do this. Like we are capable of taking on a disease. We can create vaccines faster than anybody ever thought. I will say we actually have treatments. We actually have really, we do now have treatments. But the reality is like we, I think we learned collaboration is critical. We've created them. We need to sustain them. We can do this. But I think as Dr. Brown says, like it, my fear is if we take our eye off this ball right now and go back to business as usual and just assume that it will be okay, we could be not be prepared for SARS-CoV-3. So we cannot take our eye off this ball. I think picking up on a comment Katrina made and maybe to, to try to end on a positive note, one of the things we learned is that our research community came together to support each other during this crisis. Uh, we all think of researchers as independent people, independent thinkers. Um, when, when the crisis came, people came together. They shared reagents. They shared know-how. Um, they really, uh, it was all hands on deck, and people responded in ways that um, we were very gratified uh, to see the collegiality that, that resulted. And as Katrina said, that, those collaborations are going to endure and um, I think we can take a very positive lesson. All of our researchers understand now the importance of community and what can be done when they all work and, and pull in the same direction. And if I, I may add, as someone who actually put it and create joined a large collaborative effort in an organic way. It was very empowering to do so. And much, we're all very motivated to carry on. And at the end of the day, we actually have all of the inno innovative tools to uh, enable us to tackle these big questions. The, the major challenge is unrestricted funding so that we can be innovative and tackle these big questions rapidly. And I cannot stress enough the word rapidly and not spend all our time fundraising, which is, I would say, 70% of my job. Uh, and, and what was pretty amazing with this effort and thanks to all of your generosity is that many of us could pivot rapidly and tackle the problem at a large scale. And so for that, we're very grateful for all of your generosity. Well, Dr. Bellani, I think that's a, a, a great a comment to sort of, you know, end the program on. Uh, we're actually coming to the end of the hour. Uh, I, I think you can see from all of the, uh, the panelists just the remarkable depth and breadth that we have on the uh, research and the clinical side and really the remarkable spirit in MGH when uh, uh, not only in a time of crisis does every person become our neighbor, but in the time of a crisis, the remarkable collaboration uh, that was uh, created across all role groups. Um, again, I wanna thank all the members of the 1811 Society, your uh, ongoing and, and unflagging support 
of the hospital, especially in this past year, was never more appreciated. Um, you know, thank you and be safe out there. Bye-bye.